Hello, hello, and welcome or welcome back to the Live Label Free Podcast. I'm your host, Olivia Sarah, an eating disorder recovery coach that specializes in neurodivergence. Today, we are talking about atypical anorexia, which, hint, hint, is not so atypical at all. Before diving in though, I do want to share a very exciting announcement, and that is that my upcoming book, How to Beat Extreme Hunger, is nearing publishing. If you follow me on Instagram at LiveLabelFree or are subscribed to my newsletter, which you can join at LiveLabelFree.com forward slash join, you know I recently moved back to Boston. Woohoo! So everything just had to be placed on hold for a hot minute. But now that I finally have my own apartment, I can start recording the audiobook, and when that's finished, well, then it's only a matter of dotting the I's and crossing the T's before How to Beat Extreme Hunger will be available for you to read or listen to. If you want to be the first to hear when the book is live, be sure to join the book's waitlist at livelabelfree.com forward slash extreme hunger book. And with that out of the way, let's dive into today's episode. Welcome to Live Label Free, the podcast, where you'll learn to let go of limiting labels and embrace your unique brain. As my mom says so beautifully in her song... Which is why on this podcast, you'll learn the scientific links between neurodiversity and eating disorders, giving you a deeper understanding of how you can face your fears and become truly free. Together, you and me, we will keep putting one foot in front of the other. We've got to talk about atypical anorexia. If you're a long-time listener of the podcast, you may have heard me mention the term here and there, so I figured it was about time we sat down for a dedicated episode because atypical anorexia deserves complete validation. So first off, what even is atypical anorexia? Well, according to the DSM-5, which stands for Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 5th edition, Atypical anorexia is placed in the Other Specified Feeding or Eating Disorders, OSFED, category and is defined as matching all of the criteria for anorexia nervosa with the exception of an extremely low body weight. In my previous podcast episode on the difference between anorexia and ARFID, I unpacked the DSM-5's definition of typical anorexia, so if you aren't yet familiar with the criteria and want the lowdown on how problematic all of the anorexia criteria are, be sure to give that episode a listen. Anywho, persons dealing with atypical anorexia nervosa will exhibit the same behaviors as an individual with anorexia nervosa, including the fear of weight gain and in many cases, distorted body image. But here's the catch. To be diagnosed with quote-unquote atypical anorexia, the individual must be within or above the quote-unquote normal weight range according to BMI. So basically, the presence of anorexic symptoms without an underweight BMI would make somehow the presentation atypical. Now, where do we even start with this? Okay, First of all, BMI is complete fucking BS. Again, I did an entire dedicated episode on the history of BMI and how it came to be, which I will link in the show notes if you haven't yet listened because, I mean, the history is fascinating and shocking at the same time because (laughs) BMI is such a freaking joke. But basically, BMI, short for Body Mass Index, was created over 200 years ago by, get this, a mathematician. So no, not even a medical doctor created this quote-unquote health system. This mathematician named, and excuse my French accent, 
Lambert Adolphe Jacques Quetelet was a Belgian man with a passion for probability calculus that he applied to study human physical characteristics. Quetelet is best known for his sociological work aimed at identifying the characteristics of l'homme moyen, meaning the average man in French. This quote unquote average man was Quetelet's representation of a social ideal, an ideal that he believed was the mathematical average of a population. Based on his measurement of white Western European men, so yes, BMI was created to exclude women, members of the LGBTQIA community, people of color, immigrants, and well, anyone else who wasn't a white European man. Anyways, Getzelet concluded that, quote, other than the spurts of growth after birth and during puberty, the weight increases as the square of the height. Long story short, BMI would better be called Bullshit Measurement Index. The human body is so beyond complex that there is no way for a simple math formula to decide whether or not you are healthy. I mean, just think about it. If you are constantly obsessing over food and exercise and are just plain miserable because you're being consumed by an eating disorder, well, isn't that reason enough for your weight to be arbitrary? Aside from the BMI factor, another problem with the atypical terminology around anorexia is that it's downright invalidating. An eating disorder isn't about weight or size or shape. It's about a way of thinking. It's about your mindset around food and exercise. Labeling someone who's struggling as atypical causes them to feel like they're not sick enough and like they don't deserve help. The hefty focus on weight in all kinds of eating disorders further promotes the stigma and stereotype that an eating disorder is only for thin white cis teenage girls. But if you're listening to this, I don't have to tell you that stereotype couldn't be further from the truth. Because in fact, Atypical anorexia is not atypical at all. To understand this, let's have a look at the dictionary definition of the word atypical. According to Merriam-Webster Dictionary, atypical is defined as not representative of an age, group, or class. In other words, atypical means out of the ordinary. And to use it in a sentence, a dog with three legs is quite an atypical occurrence. Now, back to atypical anorexia. If atypical anorexia was really atypical, it would mean that more people with anorexia would be severely underweight than quote-unquote overweight or quote-unquote normal weight. However, this is not the case. According to an Australian study in the Journal of Eating Disorders, atypical anorexia is five times more likely than stereotypical anorexia. And I'm willing to bet that this figure is truly much, much higher. Or how do we even account for all the people who don't seek or receive an eating disorder diagnosis due to the shame and weight stigma? Because of the restrictive behaviors an individual with atypical anorexia exhibits, they will experience the same consequences of anyone engaging in disordered eating. Think hair loss, fatigue, organ damage, heart failure, dizziness, not to mention the mental hell of preoccupation with food and exercise. You can be starving at any weight, size, or shape, as eating disorders do not discriminate. So it's about time society stopped discriminating and labeling people with silly eating disorder labels like atypical anorexia. In fact, I believe it would be much more productive to completely eliminate the word disorder from the eating disorder diagnosis. Altered ways of eating are merely adaptations to perceived danger. Just like autism is not a disorder and is rather a spectrum with different behaviors that are all adaptations to feel safe, I propose we start seeing eating disorders as a spectrum of adaptive eating behaviors. Not only would this view eliminate the questioning and doubt about whether or not your eating disorder is valid or if you are sick enough to receive help, but it opens the door to conversations about what's at the root of the eating problems. It allows people to address what's underneath. Why don't they feel safe? 
What don't they trust? Only when we are asking the questions that actually matter can we start living our answers in a way that aligns with healthy values. And that's it for today's episode. If you enjoyed this conversation, I would so appreciate it if you could leave a five-star rating on Spotify or wherever you are listening. And if you're feeling extra loving, to write a review for Live Label Free on Google. All you gotta do is type into Google, Live Label Free, and my business profile should pop up and you can leave a rating and a review. And I mean, I read all my reviews and I try to respond to them and they just make my day. And your ratings and reviews help other people learn more about eating disorders, neurodivergence, and everything in between so we can all let go of limiting labels and live a free life. Before signing off, if you are a parent or a caregiver of an autistic loved one struggling with an eating disorder, you won't want to miss the following announcement. Are you a parent or a caregiver seeking to better support your autistic loved one struggling with an eating disorder? Well, I have some exciting news for you. Imagine this, a community where you can learn from autistic individuals with lived experience of an eating disorder and connect with other parents in the same boat as you in real time. Something I've learned through working with many parents through one-on-one coaching is that they want guidance from people with lived experience, but they also want a community of other parents that are desperate to support their autistic child through recovery from an eating disorder. So me being the passionate problem solver I am, I figured why not bring my own perspective of autistic friendly eating disorder recovery together with your parental lived experience to create a program that both supports and empowers caregivers to support their autistic loved ones struggling with eating disorders. I'm thinking live group coaching calls with 24-7 access to an autistically ED-free community and tons more research, resources, and guest experts to help you understand how you can best support your autistic child the full recovery from an eating disorder. But here's the deal. I will only launch this program if there's enough genuine interest, meaning your voice matters. That being said, if you are interested in learning more about this program and potentially joining other parents just like you, please sign up for the waitlist at livelabelfree.com forward slash group. So that's livelabelfree.com forward slash group. This podcast has been recorded by your host, Liv. This podcast has been edited by my small but mighty Liv Label Free team. And the beautiful song, One Foot in Front of the Other, that you are now listening to was written and recorded by my beautiful mom, Louise Alexandra. I am so grateful for my team and everyone who supports Live Label Free. Together, we are always stronger.